I think we're good to go, so we'll get started. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming to this session. Uh, I know there's a lot of other options uh, that are exciting and interesting, but uh, I think this is going to be fun. Uh, my name is Jarek Vilkevich. I work for YouTube. And uh, today, uh, we would like to talk about uh, the challenges and opportunities related to uh, mobile video gameplay uh, uploads uh, from, from your game. Um, today, we'll have a couple of speakers. Uh, Daniel uh, Hermes, a colleague of mine uh, from Google. Uh, Kenji is, uh, Arai is uh, from YouTube BizDev. He has made this uh, talk possible by uh, amazing sponsorship and pulling strings. Uh, we have uh, Jens Owen from Lunar G. Um, uh, they build uh, pretty interesting cloud-based rendering technology we wanted to show you. Uh, we will have uh, Wayne Caro from Free Range Games. Uh, they make uh, beautiful mobile games, and uh, he's an awesome gamer, and he will have a chance to show off his skills right here, live, on stage, in five minutes. You ready? <laughs> All right. And uh, Amir Ibrahimi, who is a Unity 3D guru, uh, I would like to acknowledge Unity. Uh, they have really helped us uh, put this uh, presentation together and, and uh, allowed us to access their source code license, which was required for, for some of the approaches that we'll be describing. And last but not least, we have Kobe Cotton from Dude Perfect, uh, who just flew in this morning from Austin, Texas, where I hear it's quite warm today. All right, so uh, agenda for today. We'll talk about you know, why this is important, uh, why are we here, and why YouTube cares and why you should care. Uh, we'll talk about YouTube APIs and various approaches in which you can uh, enable video uploads from your title, and then uh, give you a couple of demos of awesome games. So let's get into it. So first of all, uh, let's just kind of look at the industry, what's happening, and I'm using uh, some stats from uh, Digital Capital. Uh, they have allowed us to share this uh, with you today. Uh, so really, uh, what's happening to the market, as you all know, is kind of segmenting uh, into two areas, value games, which is the traditional uh, AAA titles, console games, and volume games. And uh, you see a lot of the volume gaming picking up in emerging markets. Uh, also, uh, uh, markets such as Japan and Korea are doing well. And these are social games, mobile games. Uh, the, that market is actually growing very fast. Uh, so as you see, if you see at the numbers is actually 14% growth rate. Most of that is actually happening in Asia and Europe. Uh, so this is what's happening in the mobile uh, gaming space, and uh, you know we like that. Uh, if you look at the United States, actually, uh, the projection is uh, by 2014 we will have 141 million mobile gamers. So you know almost half of the country will be playing mobile games, uh, which is quite amazing. Um, now, what do gamers like to do? Uh, well, they like watching videos, and when you ask them what type of videos they like to watch, obviously they love trailers, but then the second most popular category is the actual user gameplay. So this is authentic user-generated content uh, that uh, uh, they like to watch. And you know, I'm one of them. I am quite addicted to watching gameplay videos. They are fun. But what's even more fun is creating them, and this is what we will talk about today. Um, so you know, which brings us to YouTube. Um, Couple of questions about uh, YouTube. So I wanna throw some numbers at you and see if you can uh, recognize what these numbers mean. So first number is 200 million. Any guesses what this number represents? Hint is related to mobile. No guesses? <laughs> uh, somewhat. So this is how many mobile YouTube views we had in 2010. Okay, that was a difficult question. So. Here's an easier question. 600 million. Uh, yes. Uh, you win a t-shirt. Please come find me after the talk, uh, and we'll try to hook you up with one. Uh, so this is how many YouTube uh, mobile views we get in 2012. So the number has uh, tripled. Uh, finally, 800 million. Any guesses? One observant engineer colleague of mine noticed that it's actually a sum of 200 and 600. And it is a correct answer. But uh, this is how many users we have uh, worldwide. Uh, so this is just kind of, kind of give you an idea of what's happening in the mobile space and generally in the user space. So uh, one thing about uh, the users that we found is that uh, people that uh, play video games, 
Uh, they like watching YouTube videos, and if you ask them what they do after they watch the video, a uh, fair amount of, uh, of them actually uh, goes and buys one. Uh, they buy, buy the game, and this is you know, the traditional uh, gaming market. And then a lot of them also search for more information. So this content that is out there, and remember, uh, you know, trailers as well as user-generated content generates uh, user activity. So the, the people that are interested in gaming, uh, they will actually go and find more information thanks to that content. So one example of a, a game that has very successfully integrated this functionality is uh, Talking Tom. Anybody with kids in the audience? Quite a few people. You guys have that on your phones? If you don't, you will probably soon. Um, so what they have done is they integrated YouTube video uploads into their uh, game, and it's basically a virtual pet. You can talk to the cat, it talks back to you, you can pet it, and so forth. Uh, they have 400 million uploads, uh, sorry, uh, downloads to date. So huge, huge success. 100 million active users, um, over 750,000 videos uploaded by their users. And that content has generated uh, 345 million views. And just to put it in perspective, this is actually a very significant number of views. So this is you know, in, in the same category as a lot of the YouTube stars are getting or uh, some of the popular viral videos are, are getting. So this is a really incredible number, uh, all through user-generated content. And what they've been able to do is really to enable self-expression uh, with uh, their application, their little game, and you know, the rest is history. Now, if you don't do anything, uh, if you don't want to take advantage of the trends uh, that we're seeing, uh, you'll miss out uh, on a couple of things. Uh, you know, we find our users that watch these gameplay videos are very engaged. Uh, it actually cre creates great community. And uh, all the other good stuff, promotion, analytics that come with having all that content. And you can also make a little money on this uh, through monetization, which will offset your development cost. Um, so next question is, you know, now that we look at the market and you know, all the trends are heading in the positive direction, we have these huge user populations, well, really, how hard is it? People have done this on consoles, on PC games, you know, uh, through multiple approaches, but we don't see that much of that in the mobile space. And obviously, as YouTube, we would like that because we feel it's good for the users, it's good for the industry, and it's good for us. Uh, so this brings us to YouTube APIs. Uh, quick question, who in the audience has used YouTube APIs? Fair amount of people. It's a nice community. Uh, for those of you that haven't, uh, we have uh, data APIs and player APIs. Data APIs allow you to basically integrate with our backend and do most of the things you can do on YouTube.com, including video uploads, programmatically, directly from your game. Player APIs allow you to incorporate YouTube video playback in your application. So whether it's a, a console, uh, sorry, it's a web-based web game or mobile game, you can do that. Uh, and uh, data APIs are best based on REST. Uh, if you've worked with any other uh, uh, Google APIs, uh, really, uh, they're very easy to use. Uh, player APIs, we have JavaScript, ActionScript, and we also have a new thing coming. Uh, we will be previewing it at, at Google I.O., uh, which is a um, YouTube Android player uh, API, which allows you to integrate YouTube video playback directly into your Android application uh, using Java-based uh, API. There's a session about this tomorrow afternoon um, encouraging you to see that if you would like to incorporate uh, the video playback into your title as well. So um, there's actually a couple of approaches to uh, incorporating YouTube uh, video uh, uploads into your game. And the way I look at it is I kind of see three different approaches. Uh, the you know, proven, relatively easy, reliable approach, uh, the one that is very promising but kind of out there, more futuristic, and one that is really a mix of the two. And to kind of visualize it, uh, I think this is a good analogy. So, you know, we have a Volkswagen Jetta, good solid engineering, uh, not super expensive, does the job really well, it's here today. And when we, we have the Beamer, uh, it's a wonderful car, uh, but I don't think you can buy that one in the stores just yet. Uh, it has a lot of potential. Uh, I would love to have one. Um, and then uh, we have the, uh, Prius plugin, I mean, it's definitely here today. It offers some of the advantages of the previous two, uh, not as expensive as the, the, the middle. So, so this is really what we are gonna talk about today, is you know, how do we incorporate video uploads uh, into a game using your device's, device's resources uh, within the limitations of your device? Then how can you leverage the cloud to actually uh, offload some of the processing for you 
And then uh, finally, you know, can you come up with a balance between the two to kind of have a mix of, of both uh, worlds? So now, uh, we'll talk about local video capture, uh, and we uh, will use a game from uh, Dude Perfect that was uh, recently launched. Uh, first of all, a uh, question for you guys. Who likes basketball? Quite a few people. Uh, anyone has heard about Dude Perfect? Okay, for those of you that haven't, uh, if you like basketball, uh, you will love Dude Perfect. Uh, so to give you an idea of what they do, I have a little video here, and we'll, we'll play it for you. This group of Texas A&M students have become a national sensation with their jaw-dropping. Unbelievable. Pretty good, right? It's fun to watch. Mind-blowing. Very impressive. It's amazing, incredible basketball trick shots. Take a look. Welcome to Aggie Land. This is the world's longest basketball shot. Dude Perfect. Dude Perfect. Dude Perfect. Dude Perfect. So these are our buddies from Dude Perfect. Dude Perfect. And their videos are tearing up the internet. Burning up the internet. There's talk of a video game based on this. Those deals are all still long shots. But of course, they've made those before. Dude Perfect. And with that, I would like to introduce Kobe Cotton from Dude Perfect. Thanks, <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Thanks, Yark. Really appreciate it. Guys, it's good to be here. Like Yark mentioned earlier, I came from Austin, Texas. It was 104 yesterday, and I think it was going to be 106 later in the week, so I'm pretty excited to be in San Francisco, even if only for a short time. Yeah, as he mentioned, this has obviously been an exciting journey for us. Uh, Dude Perfect's been around for three years. Um, we were formed early in 2009. Uh, these crazy guys that you saw in the video are myself. I have a twin brother and then three other roommates in college. So we started in our backyard probably like a lot of other YouTube stories, just goofing around. Um, we're all incredibly competitive, and one of the guys, Tyler, who's the one that makes most of the long shots, he was standing behind a tree. We just bought a basketball goal, and of course, it was a grass backyard, so we weren't playing your standard pickup game. And so he said, all right, bet you Jimmy John's sandwich I can make a hook shot from behind the tree. And of course, like I did every time, I was like, dude, I'll take that bet. You're not going to make any drains it. Well, then we had to get the video camera out to record it and show Garrett, who wasn't there. And so we videoed Tyler till he made it. Then I said, I can top that. So I made one from the roof. Then one of the other guys said, let's put the goal in the back of the truck. So we just started making shot after shot until we had enough for a video and loaded it to show to our friends and family. Naturally, this was during finals week at Texas A&M. So we were procrastinating a little bit. But fortunately for us, the video started to spread, and two mornings later, Good Morning America woke my brother up with a phone call and asked if they could show it that morning. So everything took off from there, and now three years later, we've made over 100 videos, um, worked with a lot of brands like you guys saw in the video. GMC was a brand we worked with on the airplane shot. Um, but we now have over 250,000 subscribers on YouTube. Um, we just recently crossed 80 million views, so that was exciting for us. Our slogan's always been, Go Big. Um, we just recently launched a book uh, that's with that same title, Go Big, so that's been really awesome as well. Um, ultimately, we, uh, we want to have a go big approach to life. So for us, it was really natural to turn this whole concept into a game. It was one of our dreams from the very beginning. When we were like, how cool would it be if we had kind of an Angry Birds-like experience but with trick shot basketball? And so a little over a year ago, we launched our game 
um, on the Apple platform was the first way that we launched during March Madness. And then just recently, like Derek mentioned, we launched for Android during this March Madness. And so um, here's some of the things that you guys just saw, some of the TV appearances. Um, we were listed by Advertising Age as one of the most in-demand brand stars on YouTube, which has been exciting as well. Um, some of the brands that we've worked with, just to give you a taste. But our game, we've been fortunate enough to be the number one sports game on the iPhone and on the Android platform at different times since the launch. Um, one thing that's been really, really cool is to take the brand that we've been able to create on YouTube, and you have this loyal base of followers, and so we didn't know if it would work or not. We weren't confident one way or the other, but we figured we'd give it a try. And because these followers are so loyal, they were really excited to jump on board with the game. And so that was one reason that it took off, and it's been really fun to expand that to Android now. Um, as you can see, we're now approaching a million downloads across those platforms, and um, we're excited to continue to expand it. Today, what we're excited to talk about is a feature that has been our number one request since the very beginning. We've had kids that tweet us in and G plus us comments and talk about how they would just love to be able to share their made shots with their friends. So right now, the way that it works is if you make some crazy shot in the game, you can watch your replay back, but as soon as you move on to the next level, it's gone. We don't have any way of saving it, and we definitely don't have any way of sharing it to friends. So that's been a huge request from our audience. And so when we were approached with the opportunity to kind of expand this um, with the help of some of the people that you've seen today and that you're going to hear from, we were really excited to jump on board with that because it's something that, like I said, has been requested so much. Um, for us, one thing that would be so incredible about this is that because these followers are so engaged, they would do a lot of the marketing for us. So what we have is as probably a lot of YouTubers can attest, you end up with some of these kind of super fans. And so they'll, they'll tweet you 100 times in a day. And so what's great about something like this is if you get the ability into their hands to share their videos to the cloud up to YouTube, they'll, they'll probably do it 100 times. So, I mean, the more that we can get people sharing videos, the better. And I think like Yarek mentioned and may talk on a little bit later, there's an opportunity for us to monetize those views as well. So we're really excited about it. Um, thanks for having us out here today. I believe we're going to move forward with a little bit of a demo of how this is going to work in our game. Thank you. So Amir has actually uh, worked on uh, implementing the video capture uh, in Dude Perfect and integrating with our YouTube APIs. And he's a Unity guru, so I'm going to Hand it over to Amir okay. and let you drive this. <clears throat> so on-device capture is a, is a hard problem because you have to read back from the buffer. You have to encode on the device. Um, but we'll start first with how it, how it works for Dude Perfect. So um, do we want to demo first? Or? Yeah, let's go ahead and demo it first, and then we'll go through. Kobe's going to laugh because... Uh, I am no dude perfect uh, expert. Dude perfect. So I'm going to do the hardest level, of course, level one. I was hoping I was going to get that on the first shot. All right. Oh. No pressure. Oh, man. All right. OK, let's, let's do this again. I guess this is uh, the better of uh, this or a, a, a blue screen of death. So um, there we go. All right, good, good. All right, all right. So <laughs> Dude Perfect already had a replay theater built into the game where you can play back your replay. So we'll go ahead and do that just to to watch that awesome shot all over. Again. 
what, what we did at Luminary is we added the YouTube support. So now I'm going to run um, YouTube, and I'll explain why we, we did the first shot and, and then why we're going back and doing this again. So what we're doing now is we're actually encoding the video frames on the device. Uh, we're encoding this at 15 frames a second. And um, you'll notice there's no audio, and there's a reason for that. Um, the, uh, the first pass that we actually played back, we recorded all the audio. And this is, um, audio is a problem, and you'll hear it through, other, through the other implementations uh, when it comes to encoding. So we had to record the whole buffer of audio. And what we do is as we encode the video frames, we're giving a time slice of the audio as well to FFmpeg. Uh, once this is all encoded, um, we'll be able to uh, upload directly to YouTube. Yeah, demo fill. Well, so this is uh, OAuth. This is how, um, uh, this is something that I was using for debug purposes, but um, uh, of course. Well, so what we have to do is, um, should we just show the video instead? Yeah, I'll get back to that. So um, in order to upload to YouTube, you have to have, um, you have to have authentication, of course. You, you can't just upload to a person's account without having authorization. So, um, so that was a makeshift OAuth implementation just to hook those things up. Those things aren't as interesting as the encoding, which is why um, you know, that'll be replaced with uh, a standard UI that you see for most apps for, for authorization. So let's go into how all of this works. Um, so Dude Perfect is a Unity game. Um, it was written in JavaScript, um, and in Unity you can write in either JavaScript or C-sharp uh, as managed languages. Um, the uh, video frames are sent off to FFmpeg, and those are encoded into VP8, the video part is, and the audio frames are encoded into Vorbis. Um, with that, inside of a WebM container, you've got a uh, video that you can send to YouTube, and it's you know, readily available on YouTube. There's not much processing that has to happen. Um, so the, uh, so looking at the code. So on the, on the left, we've got the JavaScript for the game. They already had the uh, VCR capability. And what we hooked in is if you look at the FFmpeg part, we uh, record audio on the first pass and then record video on the second pass. Um, on the C Sharp side, where we've written a plugin, um, we, yield to the end of the frame so that we can read back the buffer. We then encode that video frame. And we're using a buffering mechanism of uh, rendering to one render target, reading back from that rendering to the other target. And we saw an improvement of you know, roughly 340 milliseconds to 41 milliseconds by doing that. Um, the actual encoding takes about 200 milliseconds. 100, 100 of that is for the video encoding, and then 100 of that is for uh, flipping a buffer. Um, so this is the interface for the managed part of this. These are all native functions that come from FFmpeg or that are written in a native DLL and then imported into Unity. Um, so if we look at the actual C code, we're registering the, the codecs. We, are, uh, we have callbacks um, set. We're, uh, FFmpeg can guess the formats for the video and audio parts of that if you just hand it a uh, file. And then we initialize the video and audio stream. So for the actual video encoding, um, we just use GL read pixels. Unity has the ability to read back a buffer and you can get those that pixel data in your managed code, but since we're using it for FFmpeg, there's a lot of marshalling that would go on with copying buffers and it's just not performant enough. So instead, we read it at the native level, and then we pass that on to uh, the encoding process. The, um, the picture comes from GL flipped upside down, so you have to set the buffer to the very end, set the pitch to negative, and then you, you can flip it using SWS scale. Additionally, with SWS scale, you get uh, RGBA to YUV conversion, which you need for, uh, for VP8 encoding. And one more point that's worth 
saying is that the, near the bottom, there's a, a point where we rescale the time frame and set a presentation timestamp. And it's important to know that, you know, for the video encoding and the audio encoding, you have two different uh, time bases. One is one over, you know, your capture frame rate. The audio is usually one over your sample rate for your audio. Um, and then you need to scale each of your um, timestamps to match that, um, that time base. Um, and if, you're, if you end up doing this yourself, or, uh, it's important to know that the audio and the video don't have to use the same time base. Uh, so for the audio side, we're just we're filling up a buffer. We uh, we encode that audio and then set a presentation timestamp for that as well. And finally, the the data we send to YouTube, you can and this is important too, um, so that game that the videos get discovered. You can set your URLs and you can set tags for the the videos you're uploading that so that when people search for videos, your video will show up. Um, and that's all just, you know, if you've used YouTube's API, you're probably already well aware of that. Um, so this is an example gameplay video. Um, but, you know, I don't know if we, we're just going to, okay. Um, the videos are, the, for a shot like this, this is roughly 350K. So it's a very quick upload once you've already compressed the frames on it. Um, That I think uh, we'll hand it over to Danny. Where's the clicker? All right. Um, so I'm Danny Hermes, the other Googler, uh, along with Yarek, and uh, we worked on an approach that's almost the opposite extreme of this. They did everything on the device, and we did as little on the device as we possibly could but we still, at the end of the day, are uploading video to YouTube. So before I get into the details of how we do it, I'm gonna let Yarek demo it, and hopefully the demo gods smile on us a bit more than they did on Amir. So let's see it. We see a game. There we go. Wonderful. So this game that you see is uh, it's called uh, Platformer. It's a, a long-running uh, open-source game, originally for uh, XNA Platformer on uh, .NET, and ported over to the PlayN framework by us, where we added our hooks to make it run. Uh, ran on Android already, but to to do the uh, the hooks that make it perform on the cloud. So Yarek just jumped up on a platform and fell and died, because he's terrible. Uh, but hopefully, at the end of my talk, we can see that on YouTube. Uh, so before I get into the details, uh, I just want to provide an overview. So first, obviously, they start off on an Android client, right? And then from there, they play the game, and the game data gets sent to cloud storage somewhere. So we're already off the client. They finished playing, and we're already off the client. Like I said, the other extreme. Then from there, once the data gets to the cloud, it goes through a, when, a render step. And after it gets rendered, the frames and sounds and other assets get stored locally on the machine doing the rendering. From there, they get encoded into the final video that needs to go to YouTube. And that final video gets stored back in the cloud. And then, of course, after it gets to the cloud, we upload it to YouTube and possibly even YouTube 3D if that's something uh, that we wanted. This video you see on the client there could allow 3D. Our proof of concept didn't get that far. We were more concentrating on all these other steps, getting it to the cloud, doing the rendering and coding, uh, rather than the game itself. So uh, what were our requirements to actually make this work? First, we needed Linux machines to do our rendering. We needed to be able to use libraries like FFmpeg to actually uh, then take the, uh, the rendered code, the, or excuse me, the rendered frames and sound assets and turn them into video. We needed to be able to run arbitrary binaries, right? Uh, in addition, we needed this cloud storage mechanism. We needed a place to put things that we could go back and grab later, uh, and then, of course, use to upload to YouTube after we stored it. Uh, 
And another piece, the, the final piece, probably the most important piece, was a controller. We needed a controller that had as many arms as it possibly could have to, uh, to be making sure everybody was in the right place at the right time, that storage was behaving how it was supposed to, and that storage and the renderer were talking to each other, and all these other parts of the process. And of course, we needed this to be as the most reliable piece of the system because it's controlling the system. And finally, this isn't actually a component, it's a feature. We needed all of these components to be decoupled because if one went down and the others didn't, we wanted the experience not to be completely broken. And we were able to accomplish this. So the first thing that we satisfied was the controller. For the controller, we used Google App Engine. Uh, obviously eating our own dog food, but it's a great, a great use for this because uh, we were able to set up URL listeners. So when the client wanted to do something or when the renderer wanted to do something, it was able to make a post to the controller and say, hey, I'm done, or hey, I just started, or do things like this. In addition, Google App Engine has a great uptime SLA, so we didn't have to worry about things like setting up an Apache config on some machine and worrying if that machine would go down or change addresses or things like this. We just press play and it worked. Uh, another feature that we used with App Engine that was huge for us was task queues. You can imagine uh, as users, more and more users have finished playing the game and they're ready to have their gameplay uploaded to YouTube, it needs to go in some sort of queue. And so we were able to use pull queues, uh, pull task queues with Google App Engine to serve for this function. Uh, and finally, the ability to actually send requests with Linux machines, uh, send data to them and receive data from them was a very big, important part um, of App Engine. And then, of course, a nice to have, maybe have the controller send messages back to the clients. So we use cloud-to-device messaging uh, within uh, App Engine to send messages to Android uh, to say, hey, your video finished uploading. So the next piece for st cloud storage, we used Google Cloud Storage. Uh, uh, since we used uh, App Engine as our controller, it was great to have cloud storage because through various libraries and features, there's a file system-like integration with App Engine. I'm not gonna get into that today, but we could treat the, the cloud files as if they were local files. Uh, in addition, for our Linux machines that were doing the rendering, there was a command line tool called gsutil that we could use to, again, pretend like our cloud, cloud file system can talk to the local file system as if they're in the same place. So for example, to copy uh, our video, our WebM video that we've rendered and encoded, it was as simple as calling gsutil cp using this library and copying the local file, video file.webm, up to this bucket, gs colon slash slash videos, which represents a bucket in the cloud. Uh, and a bonus, after we started working on this project, another great piece of decoupling, there are post upload hooks in cloud storage, and this is something that's recently been announced. And so rather than having to have the, the renderer or the client or some other piece tell the controller, hey, some upload is finished, we can just set a hook on the actual storage bucket, and that hook can then send a message off to the controller. So this component is really self-contained. It's really, really phenomenal. And finally, again, another super important part, but maybe not quite as specific, was our renderer machine. So this was just a number of Linux machines, like I said, that we can run native code on. We could run our game rendering binaries, and we could run FFmpeg after the fact to do other things. And of course, we needed scalable resources, so we needed to be able to have more of these machines uh, as we got more users. And of course, finally, we needed to upload that, the video to, to cloud storage after we were done rendering and encoding. So how do we tie all these pieces together? I went through the requirements. I said how we satisfied them. Now what? So I mentioned uh, we used PlayN, the platformer game, and added in our own hooks. So here are some of our own hooks. We added a, a class, a Java class called Replay Store, uh, and this, among other things, had an increment frame function, which knew if it was actually doing the replay or live. And if it was not doing the replay, it would capture the frame and set it to a place where it would store it. It is a replay store. It is what it says it is, right? And then using that hook in the actual update function for the game that's painting each new frame as it comes, if we knew that we were replaying, if we have this, uh, this local replay store object, replay store with a lowercase r, we, if that was replaying, rather than taking user input, we would take the input directly from the store 
and substitute it for the user input. And this is how our renderer worked. And of course, we would repaint the frame and capture it. So uh, how did the rendering work? This is, you know, we're capturing these frames and, and simulating the user with the replay store, so then what? So uh, the available machines uh, of, of, of our army of Linux machines were able to pull for new jobs from the controller. I mentioned this task queue. They just say, hey, task queue, do you have anything for me to do? And if it did, then they would start rendering. They retrieved the gameplay data not from the controller, but from the decoupled component, Google Cloud Storage. And again, we're able to use this awesome command line tool, GSUtil, to just copy it from the cloud bucket, gameplay underscore data dot JSON, to the local, uh, the current directory. It's really that simple. Just pretend like they're on the same file system. From there, we used our binary to replay and capture each individual frame that gets painted as uh, uh, just a single image file. From there, to do the encode step on the rendered data, we stitch the frames together with FFmpeg. We also know the, each, uh, the frame that each individual sound was played on, so using SOX or Sound Exchange, another open source tool, we were able to add padding to the front of each of the sound assets and then squish them together to have the, uh, the rendered uh, sound file at the end. And then finally, we put those, the video and audio pieces together and we upload that encoded video to YouTube, first uh, by uploading to cloud storage, and then from there, uh, uploading to YouTube with the controller. Okay, so uh, I'm pretty sure the video is done uploading, but before we get to that, uh, I wanna talk about some challenges we ran into. And there were many, uh, but there were a few uh, that were mentioned earlier. Amir also mentioned this with sound. Uh, so first, a, a challenge in implementation is uh, UX intrusion. For native games on an Android client, uh, you don't have to worry about an internet connection most of the time, and they're really fast, and they're really great to use. But if then you need to add the part where you send it off to the cloud, you don't want to intrude and make this experience be completely dissonant and just kind of terrible overall when you add the, the video upload part. Uh, another issue, which was actually an implementation issue rather than a design issue, was the inconsistent state from what the users saw and then from what we were able to render. And this is, uh, there are various issues. Uh, one, e you have some sort of concept of frame rate, but each individual frame isn't really whatever 60 frames per second or whatever 30 frames per second comes out to, you know, 17 or 34 milliseconds or all these numbers, right? They actually vary slightly. And so as you go, you can actually have things that can end up being a little bit out of sync but maybe if the gameplay is long enough, they can be so much out of sync that when you jump on the bad guy to die, he's no longer there and you don't die, right? So these are some issues that we're still working out and we very much acknowledge. Um, and uh, like I said, sound is hard. Uh, just to give uh, a little bit of an example, all of our sound assets are sampled at 44.1 kilohertz, 44,100 uh, hertz. So uh, when we were stitching with FFmpeg, we actually had to feed it a frame length, and we fed it 17 milliseconds, which comes out to about 60 frames per second. And so 17 doesn't evenly divide 44,100. What does that mean? So you have 44,100 samples, and if you cut off some fraction every time you need to add a padding based on the number of frames, then you're actually losing fractional samples for each sound asset you pad. So you actually have another piece of inconsistent state, and that's in the, the sound. Maybe you jump and then, you know, like 100 milliseconds, but long enough for the human ear to detect, you hear the guy actually going, ugh, to jump. You know, things like that. And then finally, uh, this is something which is easy to overcome. Our, it, this was specific to Play N uh, and the, uh, the platforms we were using. But we're, we're hoping to open source this and let the community let these problems work themselves out. So, Yarek, did the demo gods smile on us? Let's check. Yarks, okay. So, there we go. There you go, and he's terrible. <laughs> All right, with that, I'll uh, 
give the floor back to Yarek for a short bit so he can introduce. All right. Thanks, Dan. I do want my pointer back. <laughs> nice try, man. Um, all right. So we talked about the local approach and then the cloud-based approach. So now uh, let's talk about something that is a little bit in, in the middle. But first, I would like to introduce uh, Wayne Cara from Free Range Games. Uh, they make wonderful mobile games, and he will tell you more about Free Range and play some games as well. All right, thank you very Thanks, much. Ryan. Here's the other screen. Okay, I'd like to just start off by um, doing what I do best, or, or actually not really, I'm probably one of the worst gamers, um, but um, I do like playing our games. I'll explain a little bit more about this um, later, but this is the first mobile game that our studio uh, um, developed. Uh, we've had a lot of console experience. That's great. And this is a snowboarding game, and the object is to get as many points as possible in, the, um, in a limited amount of time. You get points by uh, doing tricks. And uh, you can get more points by going off the jumps. So I'm just going to go off this one jump here and then get on with the rest of our uh, presentation. OK, so that was just a little bit of, a little taste of the game. Uh, I'm Wayne Cairo, the director of products at Free Range Games. Our core team um, has been together for uh, well over a decade, uh, previously uh, working at Activision, where we worked on a lot of uh, AAA uh, console titles, uh, and our, uh, a lot of our DNA is in the skateboarding genre. Uh, we worked on Tony Hawk. Uh, and since 2009, we started our own studio, Free Range Games, where we're developing uh, both mobile and web games, trying to bring that same console quality uh, to a mobile device. Uh, and we're doing all of the development with the Unity 3D engine. Uh, because of that, it, it precluded the, the solution that Daniel was uh, talking about. Uh, and then one of the big concerns that we had was we were really pushing the mobile devices to the uh, edge of their performance with the snowboarding game, with some of the, the features that we are trying to implement. Uh, so uh, we really needed a, a solution that, uh, uh, that would accommodate what we're trying to do. Now, uh, before I get into that, though, uh, I'd just like to give you a flavor of some of the other games we're working on, because we have many things in the pipeline. Uh, one of the browser games that we've just launched um, in open beta uh, up on Congregate is Freefall Tournament. This game uh, is a Space Marine shooter. Uh, uh, it's pretty exciting, very intense. Uh, and uh, it quickly, um, despite uh, all of the early bugs that you would see in, uh, in, in a beta build, uh, it quickly rose to the number one multiplayer uh, game spot there on Congregate. Uh, really would appreciate any feedback that you have, so if you play the game, please leave a comment in the forums or something, and, and I'm the guy that's uh, personally responding to everybody. Uh, and uh, we're making mobile games as well. Uh, Freefall Horizon uh, is nothing like... Uh, Freefall Tournament, um, except we're leveraging some of the same art style and trying to e extend the brand experience uh, around this uh, Freefall universe. Uh, Freefall Horizon is a very um, uh, familiar space-themed game. Uh, I think that if you are a fan of uh, quite a few of the movies in the past, you'll, you'll recognize uh, some of the thematic elements. Uh, this is an endless run game where you're, you go in, blow up a reactor, and you're trying to escape the shockwave. Uh, and there's some interesting mechanics where you're uh, tilting the device, as well as missiles and explosions. Uh, and we hope to be launching this uh, uh, quite soon. And then, of course, Summit X Snowboarding, the very first game that uh, we, uh, we developed. 
uh, what we're trying to do here is leverage our experience in um, extreme sports uh, video games and create um, the most majestic 3D terrain possible, as well as very realistic physics for the character, um, and uh, just see what a, a mobile device could do. Uh, and then we, we did something that no other snowboarding game has tried to do as well, is to have uh, basically open up the mountains so you could have lots of um, different paths that you can take. Uh, you can't completely carve the entire mountain, but uh, as far as the game goes, it, it does feel like that. Uh, we're very fortunate that a, a publisher out of uh, Korea um, come to us, uh, picked this up, uh, and, uh, and they uh, launched it December 15th. And the game was, um, was featured by uh, Google uh, when it was on the Android market, and um, very prominently so. So we, we uh, owe a lot of th thanks and gratitude to Google for that. And today, the game has nearly a million and a half downloads. Uh, and so based uh, off of that uh, little bit of success, we're trying to say, think, how can we um, leverage it and do something that would be really cool that our players would be excited about? So we started internally talking about uh, you know, getting the gameplay videos up onto YouTube. And it just so happened the timing was excellent. Um, and I, I was introduced to, to, Ken, uh, to Kenji and Yarek to uh, kind of see if we could do this for our type of game. Uh, we thought that the video would be really great because you'd be able to share your awesome moments with your friends. Um, and then a lot of our players that are really into the game are competitive. Uh, and they want to see not only um, uh, how, uh, they, they not only want to show off how well, good they're doing, but they want to see how the other guy is done and get some clues on how to get higher scores from another guy's performance. Uh, and then from a business side, uh, we're always um, concerned about discovery, getting it. Um, your game, one in 10,000 a year, uh, noticed uh, today is, is a big challenge. So if we can uh, leverage YouTube as a viral channel, maybe we can get a leg up in having our games um, noticed. Uh, and then, uh, like has been mentioned also, monetization. Uh, we're hoping to, um, to launch all free-to-play games going, in the f uh, go going forward into the future, and we want to have some way to ensure that we can continue maintaining the game. Uh, and are looking to a little bit of ad support for that. Uh, although we've made uh, games for, uh, for well over a decade, uh, we've only been making game, uh, mobile games for under a year. And uh, here's a few of the things that we've learned in that time. That uh, performance uh, on the mobile device is, uh, is really critical if you're trying to do a game that has these uh, high, um, high quality 3D graphics like ours. Uh, selective use of shaders and transparencies uh, is something you should be uh, well aware of. And then bundling assets. So on lower end devices, you don't put too high of resolution uh, art uh, onto those devices to, uh, um, to get a performance hit. And then if you try to do anything new and innovative, it requires um, background processing, like getting the gameplay uh, up onto YouTube, uh, uh, you have to be mindful of the rest of the game design. Because we're doing all of the design uh, on desktops, uh, but the game runs on a mobile device, we just found that the best way that we can ensure that we're having um, acceptable performance um, uh, for the player is just to continuously build and then test, build and test on the device. Uh, and then the mobile system, it's not like designing um, a console game. There's so many different devices out there we really had to uh, work pretty hard to build a flexible UI system in, into right. Unity so that we could handle all the different screen dimensions for this heterogeneous device mix. But the thing um, above all that I'm really excited about in this space uh, is that hardware is continuing to um, advance uh, very, very rapidly, opening new possibilities for innovation, um, such as uh, what we've done today, getting the gameplay up on YouTube. Uh, and as a business strategy, we're trying to um, leverage these technological advances so that people um, can find our games, get excited about them because they're going to be off, uh, they're going to be giving uh, new play uh, styles and, and other new experiences uh, to the consumer. All right, and uh, I'll return it to Yarek. Thank you. All right. Uh, so now I would like to introduce uh, Jens. Owen from uh, Simi Gaming to talk about their 
uh, cloud-based rendering solution. Thank you, Eric. So we're 3D driver guys, and we come at this from a little bit different perspective. Um, you know, we've, we've done high-end workstation tuning uh, for drivers, 3D drivers, low-cost laptops, desktops, and we've gone into the low power phones and uh, tablet space, and we've applied this to our CME gaming technology to take a different approach to gameplay capture. Uh, what we do is we intercept the 3D command stream before it gets sent down to the graphics subsystem. The advantage of taking this approach, you don't need a replay capability in your game, and it's much faster than waiting till it's rendered and reading back those pixels. Uh, the other benefit to CME gaming is we've added an in-game in uh, integration for sharing with YouTube and your other social networks. So the dialogue you see here, this screen, is something that you can integrate in your game, it's under your game's control. And finally, as Yarek mentioned, we're a hybrid approach, so we can offload the video conversion to the cloud, which saves time and battery on your device. So in the demo that you saw Wayne run earlier, um, we are actually capturing the entire run, the entire level, and uh, Amir instrumented that game so that it would, would mark the best jump and um, capture the previous 10 seconds of that jump. At the end of that run, we were sharing and, and, and basically um, popping up that uh, dialogue. You didn't see it after, after Wayne's uh, run there. We worked with Unity uh, to, and Amir from Luminary Productions to enable the capture of that command stream as it's emitted from the Unity engine. And then finally, um, after all of this is done and captured in the 3D command stream, again, we're uploading that command stream up into the cloud, being converted there to video, and that saves time and battery on the device. Amir provided us with these code samples here. On your left, you see that uh, the simple inclusion of a header file we're able to redirect that command stream by recompiling that engine and, and send that out to uh, our capture system. On the right here, a couple of code changes that were made just to basically, whenever you're creating an OpenGL contact, say let's start capturing this 3D command stream, and when you're done, let's clean it up and stop. At the application level, there was a couple of changes that were made to Summit X itself. Again, I mentioned that uh, we marked the best jump so actually for every jump, we, we do an SMG mark recording call, and then we give it the number of seconds you need to go backwards in time, and it, that, that's the part that's marked for, for sharing. And then the actual share menu itself at the end of the level. And along with that call to SMG share recording, we can put a string in there that references back to your application, getting the viral effect, the marketing effect you wanna see uh, with the, the YouTube channel. The big difference we see in this approach of capturing the command stream versus reading back pixels is really in the sheer size of the number of pixels. We have three gigabytes worth of pixel data to read back versus in a very complex game like this snowboarding game, maybe 100, 200 megabytes of data for the entire level. Um, for simpler games, um, we looked at Dude Perfect, for example, that, that uh, cool graphics but the stream was a lot smaller. The whole, the whole, you know, 10 shots is about 30 megabyte file. So it's just a lot smaller. It's orders of magnitude smaller than reading back the pixels. So that's the advantage of reading the 3D command stream. And at this point, um, we have a gameplay video that we can, we can show you from the creation of that. This is a video of, uh was it uh, Wayne playing? Yeah, uh, so this is one that we created earlier. This is what it looks like. All right, and then uh, we did get the uh, Dude Perfect uh, video uploaded. I think Wi-Fi is a little slow, but uh, see, 26 minutes ago. This is Amir's awesome shot.
Thank you. Let's just switch back. Uh, so at this point, uh, I'd like to summarize. If you have nice games, if you throw in a little YouTube API integration, uh, you'll make your gamers happy. And uh, we have a few minutes left uh, open for questions. I think our SummitX uh, video is still rendering. It might finish by the time we're done talking. Uh, if not, uh, Amir is gonna post it on his stream. Any questions uh, for the, any of the speakers? Yeah. There's a question. Uh, maybe you could use the mic if possible. Okay, so the question is about the audio processing. Do you wanna take that, Amir? Cool, thanks. Yeah, so the audio on that one, uh, just using a fixed size cue essentially for uh, the, the 15 seconds of audio that we want. Uh, I mean, we're capturing real time uh, using a DSP filter in Unity, you can you can capture all the audio that comes through. So, um, yeah, we just capture the last 15 seconds, and when we mark a point, we send that buffer off as a copy, and we keep uh, um, we keep uh, recording the audio in case you know there's a new mark point. So, um, yeah. Any any other questions? Going once, going twice. If not, then thank you very much for coming to this session. And uh, please get in touch with us if you are planning on integration of your mobile game uh, into uh, integration of YouTube API into your mobile game. Have fun at IO. <laughs>